So we can start by saying that the origins of the National Gallery lie in Vienna. But we'll return to this in just a moment. The National Gallery was one of the first institutions in Britain to be called national. The Academy of, the, uh, the Academy of Arts was royal, and the great museum established in 1753 with the purchase of the collections of the physician and naturalist Sir Hans Sloan became the British Museum. The gallery was called national because from the start it was very clear that it belonged to the nation. That is, the collection of pictures that it housed belonged to everyone. In spite of the grandiose facade familiar to all visitors to London, some years ago, Charles Somerus Smith, my predecessor, who was director in the early 2000s, became acutely aware that nowhere on the building did it say what the building was. And so he had carved on the pediment the name of the institution and the letters gilded. It doesn't always help enormously, I have to say, because when it says National Gallery, people immediately think it's British art, and we have to say, no, the taste is down there. Uh, and then they come looking for the Vogue exhibition, and we have to say the portrait gallery is around the corner. So I'm not quite sure it achie achieved its purpose. But anyway, there it is, the National Gallery, <clears throat> in triplicate, in fact, on the, on the facade. Situated in the very gangway of London, to use a 19th century phrase, along the north side of Trafalgar Square, the gallery contains, I'm quoting from the gallery's statement of purpose and objectives, 2016, a uniquely important collection of some 2,400 paintings which tell a coherent story of European art spanning seven centuries from Cimabue to Degas. The Board of Trustees of the National Gallery holds the pictures in trust on behalf of the nation." End quote. The National Gallery was a late arrival among European capitals. It was preceded by the Louvre in 1793, the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam in 1800, and the Prado in Madrid in 1819. Conscious that there was no national collection upon which to establish a national gallery, several influential voices were calling for the creation of such an institution when a remarkable opportunity arose in 1824. The financier of Russian origin, John Julius Angerstein, who had a choice collection of European masterpieces, had died in 1823. And the Prime Minister, Lord Liverpool, was prevailed upon to acquire it as the nucleus of the National Gallery. Because there was nowhere to house it, the lease of Angerstein's house was also acquired. And so, on the 10th of May, 1824, at 100 Pall Mall, not far from where the gallery now sits, the gallery first opened its doors to the public. The building was modest, embarrassingly so. It's the one you see here. That was the National Gallery in 1824. Even the Brits themselves laughed, uh, comparing it with the Louvre and with the other great institutions that had been uh, inaugurated on the uh, continental mainland. But even if the building was modest, the idealism that underpinned it was potent. The influential member of parliament, George Agar Ellis, who had vigorously promoted its creation, wrote a few weeks before the opening. There must be no sending for tickets, no asking admission, no shutting it up half the days in the week, its doors must always be open, without fee or reward. 
To be any use, it must be accessible and conveniently accessible to all ranks and degrees of men, to the indolent as well as the busy, to the idle as well as the industrious." End of quote. The only condition was that visitors should be decently dressed. If the exterior was modest, the collection that hung on its walls was not. Angustine's collection included 38 paintings, and among them was Sebastiano del Piombo's Raising of Lazarus, as well as Hogarth's Marriage a la Mod series, uh, five landscapes by Claude. You can see some of them hanging either side of the Sebastiano del Piombo Raising of Lazarus. Uh, in this painting uh, dating from 1834 of the interior of 100 Pall Mall. I said a moment ago that the origin of the gallery lay in Vienna, and here is why. In the 1790s, the British government had made available to the Austrian crown some six million pounds in war loans to fight the French. In 1823, just as the Angustine collection became available, and when the war loans had practically been forgotten, the Austrian government unexpectedly paid back a portion of what it owed. In April 1824 then, some 60,000 pounds of that money was voted by Parliament for the purchase and upkeep of the Angustine collection. Sir George Beaumont, whom you see in this picture here, a painter and collector, a friend of Constable, in 1826 realized the gift he had promised to make if a national gallery was founded. And his gift was made up of 16 pictures from his collection, among them Rubens's landscape with Hetstein and Canaletto's stonemason's yard, two of the favorite pictures in the gallery today. So at the genesis of the National Gallery lies a purchase made with a government grant and a donation from a private individual. This has continued to be the character of the collections up till today, because today, of those 2,400 or so paintings that make up the collection, just under half are purchases, and just over half, some 1,320 paintings, are gifts. The Prime Minister at the time, Lord Liverpool, <coughs> chose to have himself portrayed by the fashionable portrait painter of the moment, Thomas Lawrence, holding the bill for the foundation of the gallery. He was committed to the gallery housing not only British art, as some royal academicians wanted, but European paintings. These, declared his chancellor, Robinson, in a fit of self-righteous passion, were not to be, I quote, the rifled treasures of plundered palaces or the unhallowed spoils of violated altars, but splendid works of art worthy of the nation, end quote. Lord Liverpool, you might not expect it looking at that portrait, was also in favor of allowing in children and infants, including babies at the breast, into the gallery. They weren't allowed in, for example, at the British Museum or at Westminster Abbey. Because if this was to be a gallery for all, then those who could not afford nannies to look after their babies should not be barred from visiting. 100 Pall Mall quickly proved inconvenient and too small to house the gallery's growing collection. And in 1838, a new building designed by William Wilkins opened on Trafalgar Square. It was grandiose, but not grand. And in the austere spirit of the times, Wilkins made a virtue of reusing bases, columns, and capitals from Carlton House, and sculpture carved but not used for the Marble Arch, then in front of, the Buck of Buckingham Palace, British parsimony. A seated Britannia was transformed into Minerva, 
and a winged victory became pictura, with the addition of brushes and a palette. The gallery, as you can see from this plan, was only one room deep. And the east wing, over here, housed the Royal Academy. So effectively, the National Gallery was just that. The collection at this stage reflected aristocratic collecting, noble collecting in Britain, and was composed principally of 16th century Italian painting, Raphael, Titian, Correggio, and 17th century classicizing painting, the Caraccis, uh, Poussin, and Claude. But in 1842, a new arrival marked the spectacular start of a new collection for the gallery. Van Eyck's Arnolfini portrait was the first work of what has become a small but very fine collection of early Netherlandish painting. Formerly in the Spanish royal collection, it had subsequently found its way into the possession of a Scottish soldier, James Hay, who had fought at Vitoria in northern Spain. We suspect the picture may have been in the baggage of King Joseph Bonaparte as he fled from Spain and his baggage was captured at the battle precisely of Vittoria and had somehow been appropriated by Hay, probably on the battlefield. Thomas Lawrence showed some interest in the picture but could not persuade the Prince Regent to buy it and it remained in Colonel Hay's house, as he then was, with no one taking any notice of it for nearly 15 years. The gallery acquired it in 1842 at the recommendation of the keeper, William Seeger, and on being put on display, it attracted crowds of visitors. In the 1850s, following a select committee inquiry, it was decided that the gallery should have a director. Rather alarming to think that the gallery had been functioning for about 30 years without a director at all. Food for thought. The first of these, sorry, I just couldn't resist putting this uh, detail in. This is the detail of the mirror at the back of the uh, Van Eyck with the uh, reflection of Mr. and Mrs. Arnold Feeney uh, seen from behind, and of course the two witnesses, or anyway, the two visitors who are just peeping in um, through the door. But particularly remarkable is the uh, series of small tondos around the mirror, which are no more than seven or eight millimeters wide in diameter. And the scene on each of them is absolutely perfectly recognizable. These are scenes uh, of the passion uh, right through to the final scene of the, the resurrection that appears there. So I said in the 1850s it was decided that we should have a director. And the first of these was the painter and connoisseur, Sir Charles Eastlake, who is to be one of the most distinguished and an extraordinarily active buyer. He was assisted by his keeper, Ralph Wernham, who was a professional art historian, and a traveling agent, the German art dealer Otto Mundler, whose job it was to report on what paintings were available for the gallery to buy and to begin the negotiations for purchase. Eastlake himself also traveled extensively to acquire pictures, and he kept very detailed notes of the collections he visited in Germany, Switzerland, and Italy, often accompanied by his wife, Lady Eastlake. In Venice, he saw Veronese's family of Darius before Alexander in the Pisani Palace, and there began two years of complex negotiations involving competing with the interest of the French and Russian governments, spreading largesse to members of the household, the Pisani household, to ensure their complicity, and finally, in 1857, obtaining an export license from the Imperial Austrian authorities, since Venice was then governed by Austria. In the same year, Eastlake was able to acquire a selection of early Italian paintings from the Lombardi Baldi collection in Florence, including Duccio's Virgin and Child with Saint Dominic and Aurea. 
a small but exquisite triptych of about 1315. Eastlake and his successors, Sir William Boxall and Sir Frederick Burton, were acquiring, were acquiring works with a view to creating a collection that illustrated the history and variety of Italian painting. Together with the Duccio, Eastlake acquired a very early panel by Margaritone di Arezzo and declared in his notes that this unsightly work was bought only for its historical importance. It was thought to be a terrible picture. Uh, it showed, in the words of Eastlake, the rude beginnings from which, through nearly two centuries and a half, Italian art slowly advanced to the period of Raphael and his contemporaries." End of quote. At this time, the gallery also collected works by British artists, including a few examples by living painters. In 1856, it received the largest ever donation it has ever had, which was the bequest of Turner, made up of 100 finished pictures, 182 unfinished pictures, and more than 19,000 drawings and sketches. Turner had just died, and in his will, he had specified that two of his paintings should hang with two of the gallery's Claudes, both of which were pictures that had belonged to Angustine and which Turner had admired when they were in Angustine's house ever since the financier had actually bought them. Here you see on the left uh, Turner's Dido building, Carthage, and on the right the picture that it's always hung with and still today hangs with it, uh, Claude's seaport. Turner, from very early in his career, had aimed at imitating the effects of Claude's light, and in particular, the effects of his sunsets, although he had initially despaired that he would ever be able to paint anything like them. In 1897, the Tate Gallery was established, and the British collections, including the bulk of the Turners, was transferred to Millbank, to the building you all know as Tate Britain. A representative selection of masterpieces by Hogarth, Gainsborough, Reynolds, Constable remained at Trafalgar Square and remains at Trafalgar Square where they are presented within the context of the broader European tradition. We know about visitor numbers to the gallery over the course of its history on account of the annual reports that were submitted to Parliament. I'm not sure many collections can show uh, such um, graphs of the history of their visitor numbers uh, pretty much since, the, since they were founded. This graph shows, you probably can't see it from where you're sitting, but anyway, this graph shows how visitor numbers remained under 100,000 when the gallery was in Pall Mall. Um, following the opening of the Wilkins Building on Trafalgar Square, they leap up to around half a million, with an exceptional peak in 1851 during the Great Exhibition that was held in Hyde Park, this enormous, spectacular um, exhibition of arts and crafts and industry, when one and a quarter million people visited the National Gallery. The highest number of visitors in the 19th century was in 1877, the year after the opening of an extension that we know as the Barry Rooms that was being built at exactly the same time that this building here was being built, and we'll come to that in just a moment. In the late Victorian period, visitor numbers plateau around half a million. And in the 20th century, we witnessed the anomalies for the years of the two world wars, and then the beginning of the relentless growth that characterizes the second half of the century. We'll come back to that in just a moment. Soon after the opening of the Wilkins Building, the gallery was again short of space, both because of the expansion of the collection and the growth of the Royal Academy's collections, but also because, as we can see, the increase in visitor numbers. Ambitious plans for a completely new gallery were mooted, but characteristically scaled back through lack of agreement and limited funding. And in 1872, the first stone of a new wing to the designs of E.M. Barry behind the spaces vacated by the Royal Academy was laid. 
This suite of galleries, in a splendid and heavily ornate style beloved of the late Victorians, opened in 1876 and came to be known, as it still is today, as the Barry Rooms. Decorated with tondos, with busts of Michelangelo, Raphael, Rembrandt, paired off with Reynolds, Gainsborough, and Constable, as well as slightly pompous plaster reliefs of Phidias and Pericles, Michelangelo and Pope Paul III, and a grandiloquent quote from Joshua Reynolds about studying the old masters whose works have stood the test of time. Barry employed a, an advanced design for ventilating the rooms, and the lay lights he introduced into the ceiling provided diffused light, avoiding disruptive reflections on the paintings, many of which were glazed. There'd been a very, very um, active debate in the 1850s and 60s about how best to look after the collection in the center of London, because, of course, London was a very smoky, uh, smog-ridden city, and there was concern that the pictures would suffer as a result. And it was pro pro proposed to take the collection uh, on the other side of the river, potentially, anyway, out of the center. But it was felt that this was not right. The pictures should remain in the very center of London, and things should be done in order to preserve them in the best possible way, but in the Trafalgar Square building. That's how those galleries look uh, today. You'll be familiar with them, of course, uh, from visiting. Over the course of the 20th century <clears throat> and into our own, the gallery has benefited from the support of public appeal, a public appeal organization called the National Art Collections Fund, the NACF, established in 1903 in order to help public museums and galleries acquire works of art which they would otherwise be unable to afford. The Rokeby Venus by Velasquez, many of you will remember it, it was here just a few years ago, had been brought to Britain in the wake of the Spanish Peninsular War and had resided largely uncommented on for nearly a century in Teesdale in the northeast of England in the possession of the Morritt family at Rokeby Hall, hence its title, the Rokeby Venus. When it was offered for sale, the NACF, the National Art Collections Fund, decided to make this its inaugural high-profile campaign and was able to raise the funds to buy the work outright for £45,000 and donated it to the gallery in 1906. Unique in Velasquez's oeuvre because of its subject matter, remember that the female nude was almost never painted by Spanish artists. It was a morally problematic subject. It was never in the Spanish royal collection, having belonged first to the Marquis of Carpio and later to the Duchess of Alba, the one that Goya painted, uh, before passing to the collection of the Prime Minister Manuel Godoy around 1800. Its purchase turned the gallery's embryonic Spanish collection into a significant and high-profile part of its holdings. The acquisition was celebrated in Punch. Uh, the cartoonist Bernard Partridge celebrated the arrival of the work together with that of the portrait of the famous actress Ellen Terry as Lady Macbeth by showing Velasquez and Sargent walking arm in arm into the gallery, welcomed by Punch himself, desirable aliens. In 1934, Kenneth Clark, aged just 31, was appointed director. Scion of a paisley textile manufacturing family, he was very wealthy and very well connected. He had a brilliant reputation as a scholar and connoisseur, having served an informal apprenticeship with Bernard Berenson in Florence. And he had an instinct for both technological innovation and grand popular gestures. In 1934, for example, he opened the gallery at seven o'clock in the morning on cup final day to enable football fans to visit before the match. And in 1935, he introduced electric light into the gallery and called that most modern thing a press conference, the first the gallery had ever held to announce it. The gallery had never been lit with gas light. It had gone directly from natural light to electric light in 1935. 
Kenneth Clark also laid the foundations for the gallery's scientific department with the appointment of the first scientific advisor. And in 1938, he published a book of photographs with brief commentaries called 100 Details from Pictures in the National Gallery, which was both a playful and scholarly endeavor, drawing attention to fascinating fragments of both famous and lesser known works in the collection. Clark, who would later become world famous with his immensely popular television series, Civilization, an astounding combination of high culture and mass communication, said that it was in this book, the details book, that he first recognized the sound of his own voice. Ironically, Clark really came into his own during the war years when the gallery was empty of its pictures. This period proved crucial in cementing the relationship between the gallery and the public, but it was also immensely significant for the academic study of the collection. By the end of the 1930s, mass aerial bombing seemed very likely, and the gallery began planning for the evacuation of the collection. In 1938, at the time of the Munich crisis, there was a trial it was an, that involved putting eight small pictures in a taxi, driving twice around Leicester Square, and then returning them to the gallery. That was the test for uh, evacuating the entire collection. A few days before war was declared, the entire collection was transferred by train, not by taxi, train and road to a secret location in North Wales. In 1940, when invasion seemed likely, it was proposed that the collection should be taken abroad to Canada or to America. But Churchill, in his inimitable style, declared in a letter to Clark, bury them in the bowels of the earth, but not one picture shall leave these islands. The slate mines of Manod in North Wales were chosen to have these pictures on account of the fact that they were found to offer a secure and stable environment which guaranteed the safe preservation of the picture collection. But two significant things happened back at the empty gallery. The pianist, Myra Hess, offered to hold weekly concerts to provide the London public with musical and spiritual sustenance, as well as employment for the capital's musicians. An offer that Kenneth Clark took up with enthusiasm, responding that they should not be weekly, but daily lunchtime concerts. Here you see her in this photograph playing a full concert Steinway Grand in the Barry Rooms with the empty frame of the Palastrozzi on the right-hand side. That was the picture that we'd seen just a moment ago in the photographs of the Barry Rooms. Throughout the war, the concerts continued practically uninterrupted, even when, for example, Room 10 was completely destroyed by a nighttime bomb on the 12th of October, 1940. This was the room where the gallery's Raphaels had hung until August the previous year. It's just as well the collection was evacuated. In January 1942, a letter appeared in the Times which expressed regret that there was no art to be seen at the gallery and advanced an ingenious proposal. I quote from the letter. Because London's face is scarred and bruised these days, we need more than ever to see beautiful things. Like many another one hungry for aesthetic refreshment, I would welcome the opportunity of seeing a few of the hundreds of the nation's masterpieces now stored in a safe place. Would the trustees of the National Gallery consider whether it were not wise and well to risk one picture for exhibition each week? Arrangements could be made to transfer it quickly to a strong room in case of an alert. Music lovers are not denied their Beethoven, but picture lovers are denied their Rembrandts just at a time when such beauty is most potent for good." End of quote. 
Clark put it to the trustees, and after duly weighing the benefits of public morale against the obvious risks, the decision was taken to try out the scheme with a portrait by Rembrandt. And following the extraordinary success of the event, the picture of the month was launched. Every month, a distinguished work would be brought to London, shown during the day, and taken down into the vaults at night for safekeeping. Clark wrote to the assistant keeper of the collection, Martin Davis, who was in Wales in February 1942, saying that he had received numerous suggestions for which pictures might be put on show. But the ones that had most often been asked for were El Greco's Agony in the Garden and Titian's Noli Me Tangere. This latter work is the one that was chosen to be the first of the pictures of the month that continued until the end of the war. The Greco, because it was considered a studio picture, not entirely by the hand of El Greco, uh, Kenneth Clark it was thought it was not right to show this picture to the London public, given that so few pictures were going to be shown. But in considering the subject matter of this picture, the Magdalene's desire to cling to the body of her beloved saviour, who is about to depart the earth, it is difficult not to see the emotional, emotional poignancy of the choice when so many Londoners had lost loved ones in the bombings or on the front line or had husbands, fathers, sons, and brothers fighting on the front line in the continent or elsewhere. I mentioned Martin Davis, who was in Wales taking care of the collection. This time of exile for the works and for some of the staff proved to be very fruitful from the point of view of cataloging the pictures, as the gallery library had also moved to North Wales and the curators could work undisturbed by other duties. Davis was a highly methodical researcher with an unparalleled skill in combining critical analysis with synthetic commentary, and he used the time to produce the catalogue of the National Gallery's early Netherlandish school, the first edition of which was actually published in the year the war ended, in 1945. This is a, a second edition from uh, a few years later. These catalogues initiated what has become a distinctive and much admired tradition at the gallery, the production of scholarly schools catalogues, um, which provide information on the picture's technique, provenance, state of cons conservation, attribution, and so on. Lorne Campbell, some of you will know him, who was research curator at the gallery for 20 years until very recently, produced two catalogues building on Davis's, the second of which, you see it here on screen, the 16th century Netherlandish paintings, covers half of Martin Davis's uh, uh, range of pictures. It was published as recently as 2014. In the introduction to the 15th century volume, which came out in 1998, then director Neil McGregor pointed out how the entry on the Arnold Feeney portrait that we saw just a moment ago in the National Gallery's catalogue of 1843 was just 35 words long, whereas Campbell's in uh, the mid-90s, um, in a, uh, the equivalent uh, catalogue for the 15th century collections, was 38 pages long. <laughs> the Gallery's current catalogues, and in some cases we're already talking about third or fourth editions of National Gallery catalogues, contain a great deal of technical information about materials, pigments, and media, and make extensive use of the results of radiographs and infrared images. The gallery's curators work in close collaboration with the conservators and with colleagues in the scientific department in order to provide as full an understanding as possible of the creative process of the painting as well as its material history. In fact, the National Gallery has become a pioneer in what has come to be generally known as technical art history, the integration of technical analysis of the work itself into the broader art historical and critical study of it. In 1977 came the first issue of the National Gallery Technical Bulletin, which has made a significant contribution to the field and is the institution's only periodical published annually. 
it is much used and much cited. This is a recent, uh, a recent issue uh, devoted to the works of uh, Titian. Much information shared with colleagues here um, both ways uh, at the Kunstisorisches Museum. Under the direction of Neil McGregor, many of you will know him, who was appointed rather unexpectedly to lead the institution in 1986 after being director of the Burlington Magazine, the gallery aimed at reaching the widest possible audience through its exhibitions, its education programs, and through the use of television and radio. Neil was very articulately committed to the gallery's public role and to free access, which was under threat in 1989 in Mrs. Thatcher's Britain. Several major London museums had succumbed to the temptation of charging visitors for entry, but when he appeared before a parliamentary committee that was considering this matter, he eloquently refused to accept the precedent of France, where charging was quite normal. He said, the culture in France has traditionally been the province of the prince. It is what the state does as part of its own promotion. In this country, the pictures at the National Gallery belong to the people. Neil's directorship also saw significant advances in scholarship and a great increase in the scale and ambition of its exhibitions, principally thanks to the opportunities offered by the spaces of the newly constructed Sainsbury Wing, which I will return to in a moment. The Making and Meaning series of exhibitions, for example, focused on great works in the collection, exploring both their historical context and aesthetic significance, as well as their physical makeup, drawing on the areas of art historical and technical expertise that were already highly developed in the gallery. The Seeing Salvation exhibition, subtitled The Image of Christ, held in 2000, unapologetically explored the Christian imagery and religious meaning of many of the works in the collection and drew a massive audience of nearly 400,000 visitors, a quarter of whom had never been to the gallery before. When the gallery opened in 1824, the intention was at least partly to provide fine examples of European painting for contemporary British artists to emulate and learn from. Two out of six open days a week were initially reserved just for artists. Copying at the gallery was and remains an important activity for art students and professional painters. In the 1970s, prominent contemporary artists such as Anthony Caro and David Hockney were invited to make a selection of works from the gallery and show some of their own works alongside them. And in the 1980s, an artist in residence scheme was initiated, which later became the Associate Artist Program. Paola Rego, whom you see here in the photograph, was the first of the Associate Artists in 1990 and worked in a studio in the gallery to produce a series of works inspired by pictures in the collection. Crivelli's Garden, a frieze of which you see one of the panels there on the right-hand side, which combines references to Italian Renaissance painting with the Portuguese tradition of blue and white ceramic tiles, was one of the outcomes, and these works now decorate the gallery restaurant. Peter Blake succeeded her a few years later and produced an exhibition entitled When I'm 64, a reference both to his own age at the time and to the Beatles song from the Sgt. Pepper album for which he had designed the cover in 1967. It also happened to be the 64th birthday of Cheetah, the chimpanzee, whom you see in the background, who was Tarzan's chimpanzee, you remember this. Um, Peter Blake had discovered that, uh, that uh, Cheetah had been uh, devoting his late years to painting. And so he wanted to include some paintings by Cheetah in the exhibition. You can imagine this caused quite some consternation in the National Gallery. Uh, we're happy to show paintings by dead artists, by living artists, but we'd never shown anything by a chimpanzee before. Uh, then our registrars got onto the subject matter, and there was a big debate about how these pictures were going to be transported. Uh, was indemnity going to cover them? Uh, what was the insurance value 
of these works. Um, the whole thing became so complicated that I'm delighted to say it didn't happen and uh, 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 um, Cheetah's pictures were, were not shown in Peter Blake's exhibition. I'm sure it was uh, a, a sort of joke from the start. Frank Auerbach, for example, um, has been drawing incessantly at the gallery for decades and held an exhibition at the gallery of works inspired by the collection. If you visit the gallery Undercroft today, uh, you can see a large selection of his drawings after the masters pretty much on permanent display, reflecting how the gallery has been a fundamental reference point for him, for his art, but also by extension to a whole series of uh, British artists uh, working uh, now. Uh, this, of course, is based on Rembrandt's uh, Belshazzar's feast. I mentioned the Sainsbury Wing a few minutes ago. Um, this is the aerial view of the gallery. The Sainsbury Wing, the building on the west side of Trafalgar Square, opened in 1991, and it had a transformative effect on the gallery. The Sainsbury Wing was the happy outcome of the troubled and unhappy history of the site adjacent to the Wilkins Building, which had lain empty since the war with various abortive attempts to create an extension for the gallery, with the result being that the space had been used continuously for nearly 30 years as a car park. An architectural competition initiated in 1981 had produced a futuristic design for hybrid use, part private, part public, radically different in style from any of the other buildings on Trafalgar Square. It had elicited from Prince Charles the celebrated condemnation in a speech held in 1984 in which he described the proposal as a monstrous carbuncle spot on the face of a much loved and elegant friend. Well, that put an end to that scheme. Planning permission for its construction was not granted. The impasse that resulted was broken in 1985 by the extraordinary philanthropic gift of the Sainsbury brothers supermarket chain owners, and each of them a patron of the arts in his own way, who offered to pay for a new building in its entirety for the use of the gallery. The building that emerged was designed by the Venturi Scott Brown Partnership of Philadelphia, who created a richly allusive facade, which combined quotations of Wilkins's 1830s building. You can see how the pilasters and capitals are continued in the Sainsbury Wing on the left, with bold gestures like the sheer glass wall along the grand staircase uh, facing towards the square. The superb top-lit permanent collection galleries housing the early Renaissance collections recall both John Soane's early 19th century rooms at Dulwich and the airy Pietra Serena and white plaster interiors of 15th century Florentine churches. Here, uh, he's alluding, of course, to uh, Baroque, the playful Baroque uh, architecture with this uh, perspectival vistas, where the Pietra Serena columns actually become uh, smaller as they go into the uh, distance. They physically become smaller. Uh, and they create a perspective frame around the great Chima altarpiece at the far end. These galleries were designed around the collection, according to a principle that focused on connections between artists and schools through a series of threshold vistas that invited the visitors to move from Masaccio's Florence to Van Eyck's Bruges, from Bellini's Venice to the Augsburg of Dura. The Sainsbury Wing also provided the gallery for the first time in its history with temporary exhibition spaces in the basement. One of the things also that the Sainsbury Wing did was to provide vistas from the gallery itself onto uh, the uh, neighboring spaces, onto the square and onto the neighboring uh, Wilkins building. The new foyer at street level, literally at street level, because there is no step to enter the building, was reflective of the gallery's desire to be as accessible and as approachable as possible. There were spaces, of course, for a new shop and restaurant, and seminar rooms for academic gatherings, and a new computer facility called the Microgallery. 25 years on, it's difficult to think of the National Gallery without the Sainsbury Wing. 
At a recent seminar celebrating the anniversary, speakers reflected, among other things, on the remarkable character of the gift of the patrons, which ushered in a new chapter of philanthropic giving to cultural institutions in Britain, as well as on the impact the galleries have had on the understanding and teaching of the Renaissance in universities in the UK and beyond. Over the course of the early 20th century, the gallery had begun to take an interest in French Impressionism and post-Impressionism, inquiring, for example, a group of important paintings at the sale of Degas collection in 1918. An area that had featured in the early history of the gallery's collecting, Italian Baroque painting, had, however, been almost entirely neglected, a lack of interest that can be said to reflect the inherited prejudices of the Victorian critic John Ruskin, who despised the painting of the 17th century Italy, believing that its contemplation was detrimental to the moral health of the nation. From the 1930s, circumstances for purchasing paintings of this kind by the Caracci, Guercino, and Guido Reni were very favorable. And the art historian and collector, Dennis Mann, whom you see in the photograph, decided to form a Baroque collection with a view to eventually donating it to the gallery when prejudices had subsided. Mann became an informal attache to the gallery under Kenneth Clark, and later on, in the 1950s and 60s, a trustee of the institution. He was very closely associated with the National Gallery over the course of the 1990s, when his collection was catalogued and exhibited in the Sainsbury exhibition space. And at his death at the age of 100 in 2011, he donated it to various British and Irish museums, with the lion's share, 25 pictures, coming to the gallery, including a superb group of works by Guercino, for example, the uh, large altarpiece of St. Gregory the Great with uh, two Jesuit saints, and uh, Guido Reni's uh, late Rape of Europa, painted for the King of Poland. He did, however, attach some conditions to his gift, which were agreed with the gallery, and which reflected shared and deep-rooted convictions about the nature of the institution, its relationship with the public, and the integrity of its collections. The Marne pictures will be forfeited if the gallery ever introduces an entrance charge for visitors, or if it sells any work from its permanent collection. So anyone who decides to introduce entrance charges at the gallery, the very first thing they have to think about is that 25 pictures will immediately leave the gallery. The National Gallery organizes about eight to 10 exhibitions a year. These often fo focus on groups of works in the collection and showcase the gallery's research activities. They are sometimes monographic in nature and occasionally thematic. There is usually at least one contemporary art display per year, for example, the Associate Artists Exhibition, or works by an invited artist which somehow relate to the gallery's collection. The Leonardo da Vinci Exhibition, held in 2011 and 12, explored the artist's activity in Milan, where he painted the gallery's Virgin of the Rocks. And the recent exhibition on Goya's portraits, the first ever held on this subject, introduced the London public to an aspect of Goya's art that is less well known. At present, we are planning an exhibition in the spring of next year that aims to throw light on the artistic relationship between Michelangelo and Sebastiano del Piombo, based, of course, on the fact that NG1, uh, the first item in the inventory of the National Gallery, is the great raising of Lazarus by Sebastiano that we saw uh, a short while ago, uh, which Michelangelo provided drawings for. This was a fertile but complex personal relationship that gave rise to some of the most moving works of the 16th century, such as the Viterbo Nocturnal Pietà. Currently at the gallery, we have an exhibition on Australia's Impressionists, Streeton, Condor, Roberts, and Russell, four painters who in the 1880s and 90s used the international language of Impressionism to devise a new iconography for the young country that was becoming a nation with its bustling cities and broad landscapes as it moved towards federation in 1901. This exhibition reflects a recent trend to explore aspects of the European tradition as interpreted and transformed outside of Europe. This is the idea that lies behind the gallery's acquisition in 2014 of George Bellow's Men of the Docks, which shows the port of New York in 1912 
but uses the bold brushwork of Manet to paint a modern American subject. The gallery, of course, continues to seek to acquire major works which strengthen the collection, adding excellence to excellence, but also stretching the boundaries of the canon. The recent acquisition of two poesie by Titian, painted in the 1550s for the King of Spain, probably the most important old master paintings in private hands in Britain until they were bought jointly by the National Gallery and the National Gallery of Scotland, are an example of the former, adding excellence to excellence. While the acquisition last year of Winter Day by the Danish painter, Lauritz Andersen Ring, represents the latter, pushing the boundaries of the canon. These purchases bring us right up to the present. And having looked at visitor numbers to the gallery in the 19th century, um, I want to show you visitor figures as they are now. In 2014, the gallery was the third most visited museum in the world after the Louvre and the British Museum. 2014 was indeed a record year with 6.4 million visitors coming through the doors. In terms of proportions, about 60% of our visitors tend to come from abroad, which means that about 2.6 million visitors come from the UK. You will notice from the graph that the tendency has been gradual growth over the last 10 years, which reflects both the increasing attraction of cultural institutions in European capitals, as well as the relentless growth of tourism in London, leading up to the Olympics in 2012 and beyond. Last year, the figure dropped below 6 million, partly due to industrial action in the gallery over outsourcing the security and visitor information services. But this year, uh, we're likely to reach uh, that figure again. Success in visitor numbers brings with it some difficulties too. For example, maintaining high levels of security, dealing with the wear and tear on the building, and ensuring that the visitor has a rewarding experience. The cost of maintaining the gallery rises relentlessly too, although in recent years, the government grant has been falling. Sorry to show you a few graphs, but I thought it might just be useful to have a sense of the whole of the gallery. Um, <clears throat> requiring us to increase self-generated income. So here are visitor numbers rising, and here's government grant falling. Requiring us to increase self-generated income. While we are not alone in finding ourselves in this situation, the financing of the gallery into the future is, of course, one of our biggest challenges. Um, if you look at this uh, pie chart, it just gives you a sense of where the gallery's funding comes from. It costs about £40 million a year to run the National Gallery. Um, and you can see that more than half of that comes from what we call grant in aid. That's direct uh, government grant currently around 24 million. That includes a large amount for running costs and a smaller amount, typically around three million pounds, for capital projects, for renewing galleries, for refurbishing, and so on. Uh, the remainder, just a bit, bit, a bit less than half on the left there, is self-generated income from uh, donations, from sponsorship, from legacies, and of course from the gallery's own uh, commercial activities, um, principally through our uh, shop, the National Gallery company-run shops. Another significant challenge is how the gallery plays out its role on the global stage in terms of how it harnesses new digital opportunities as more and more of the world is connected online, potentially almost the entire population of the earth by 2024. I have to say, in this area, the gallery was definitely a pioneer in the 1990s with the micro-gallery that I referred to um, at the beginning, but we have inevitably fallen behind, and of course, digital has moved so quickly, so fast, uh, offering such extraordinary opportunities that I think all of us are uh, concerned to find the best way to harness the opportunities of uh, digital for engagement, for reputation, um, but also, of course, for revenue. The National Gallery, as we have seen, is a great visitor attraction in an, age, in an age of mass tourism. However, central to its identity and purpose is the connection between great works of art and people. The possibility 
which is always there and which excites me enormously, that we provide the setting for something very wonderful, potentially life-transforming, to happen when a person stands in front of a masterpiece by Piero della Francesca or Cezanne. Looking at pictures opens windows onto history, but also onto human experience. The visitor can experience unutterable beauty intersecting with his own or her own memories and personal perception. My hope is always that the person who comes into the gallery, even if it's only for a fleeting visit, can be somehow changed as a result. Looking at paintings is an immensely serious business, but it can be equally immensely rewarding. The gallery was founded in 1824 to show the nation's pictures to its owners, as well as to all who, came, or all who come through the doors. Two year, 200 years on, this still lies at the heart of what we do, making that connection happen. Thank you very much for your kind attention.